So I'm joined by Dave Campbell, Texas football insider, Shayhan Jayaraja. Shayhan, how you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude. Uh, I tried to do this segment with Shayhan last year, and it was great, and he was awesome, and I lost the episode. That w- <laughs> that will not happen this time. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. I remember last year because uh, I was <laughs> so I was in Austin. My my wife was visiting her friend, mm-hmm. so I was literally sitting in a car in, in ninety degree heat, and, oh. uh, <laughs> and then uh, then it didn't happen. I was I was sad. So oh. I'm glad that we get to do it right this time. <laughs> my goodness, yes. Uh, grill me every single time you see me about this. Every single time. <laughs> um, so Shane Bouchelle is on the cover of. A magazine this year, which is a big deal for for me because, you know, an SMU dude gracing the cover one, I mean, I guess we could make the argument about another quarterback, but he had a really fantastic season last year, and, you know, depending on what you feel about Garrett Riley, Lincoln Riley's brother, could have another one this year, right? Oh, yeah, and, you know, the funny thing about it, you mentioned, I I mean, people in Texas, obviously, when they don't get the cover, everybody's upset, right? And so, um, you know, there there definitely were people being like, oh, you know, technically he was a Texas court. No, no. Okay, this is SMU being on the cover of Dave Campbell's Texas football for the first time since 1983. Like, this is a big deal. And mm-hmm. we know, you know, when we choose to do something like this, we know sort of the, the impact of it. And so, um, yeah, no, I think that Shane was a really easy cover choice for us, you know, because like I mentioned, 10 wins for the first time since uh, since 84, mm-hmm. uh, first cover since 83. I mean, you know, you look at what SMU has accomplished over the past 30 years. I mean, it's been a real struggle. It's been a real, real struggle. And obviously, you know, there have been a couple of bright spots like under Jim Jones, but not nothing like this. They haven't gotten to this level uh, at all. And so I think that you have a story in Shane Michelle, who's a kid who was obviously kind of cast off from Texas, uh, a kid who you know, was kind of not viewed as a fantastic player, but he goes, steps into an offense that really fits him with a coaching staff that really got him. Um, and, and it just worked, you know, it just worked so well. And, you know, he threw for nearly 4,000 yards. He obviously led SMU to some big wins, including over TCU. And, and look, I think that it was really special for us to get to, to get to put him on the cover. I think so too. I mean, I was not, I was pleasantly surprised, I guess is how I, felt about it of course I live in Oklahoma so that that's easy for me to feel pleasantly surprised about it what if anything do you think we have learned about Shane Bouchelle over this journey because I mean quite literally Destiny's quarterback at Texas to uh, a rapid fall from grace almost as soon as Tom Herman arrives and sees Sam Ellinger there and I don't even know that it's that he remade himself as a player we just got to finally see what he looks like when he's firing on all cylinders, because I'm, I mean, this is one of those kids that I missed on in high school. I just didn't watch him play live. I rely on the huddle film, like, okay, Texas got another uh, middling white guy. They got another Colt McCoy. Fine, cool, whatever. And I kept it moving, and I felt like I was right. And then he goes to SMU and starts torching people. So, like, this story I thought was just from a, from a storyteller standpoint has been phenomenal to watch. Yeah, well, and I went into this story, you know, and obviously the, the feature will be out in the magazine when it comes out in, in July. But, uh, you know, I was looking at this story and I expected it to be sort of a how did he reinvent himself? But, you know, you just talked to everybody around him. And and this is these are really the moments where you realize that that fit with quarterbacks is so critical, you know, and, and fitting a roster, fitting a coaching staff, fitting a system is so critical because we saw, you know, with sort of that, uh, you know, that Baylor style offense spread with Sterling Gilbert, Mm -hmm. he was really able to thrive in it. And he comes in and they're running a lot of more sort of power spread stuff. It's just not the same, especially when you don't have sort of the offensive line that can really keep you protected. And, Mm -hmm. and that's the thing during the 2017 season is that he dealt with a lot of injuries. He was, he was very injured. And then obviously you add, Sam being a very good player, obviously, but, um, but, you know, getting to go into a system that kind of married the two systems of sort of an air raid that Sonny Dykes ran with Brett Lashley's Auburn run game. I, I think that that was just such a perfect fit. And on top of that, I mean, the talent that he had around him was definitely very good. You know, I, I don't want to underestimate that talent by any means, but, but I think that being able to go in, being able to throw the ball downfield more than he did in Herman's offense, being able to be protected, which was something that that Texas struggled to do, especially in 2017. I, I think that everything just worked. And I think, you know, it's a great story that 
look, you know, being at one of these big schools is great, but if a school does not know how to use you, I think that, you know, it's a good lesson that, that going somewhere that really wants to build around you and wants to, you know, do things that you're good at. I, I think that that's really the thing that you have to do. I, I think you make a great point there. It also showed me that Gus Malzahn's offense can work anywhere, just as long as you got a quarterback that can throw it deep and is accurate. And, I mean, that's that was my takeaway from from watching what SMU was able to do offensively. Now, defensively, another story that nobody really talks a whole hell of a lot about because they had two of the better defensive backs in college football. Matter of fact, the American had four of the better defensive backs in college football. We talk about Reggie Robinson and uh, Allie Green at TU. But just where would you expect SMU to finish this year? Well, I think that this is a big year for them because obviously – Look, last year was a confluence of a lot of events, right? Like, I think mm-hmm. that anybody on that campus would tell you they got to 10 wins faster than anybody expected. But, you you know, you go into 2020 and you've got the quarterback coming back. You've got uh, an NFL wide receiver in Reggie Robertson. You've got, you know, a couple of other guys coming in at that receiver spot. You've got basically every lineman is back defensively is where the building sort of needs to happen, but they've got guys coming back, you know, Chevin Calloway is a guy who transferred from Arkansas. Who's not going to be a starting safety. And, and Cameron Jones is a, is a former blue chip player from Nebraska. And they've got Michael Williams, who was a, a four star defensive tackle who played at Stanford for three years and is grad transfer. Like they have options. This is, this is not a team that doesn't have talent. So if they can leverage this into winning eight, nine, 10 games, once again, I mean, I think that just, means such great things for their future so i want to get to the portion of this uh this show that i love the most which is uh best in texas where i ask you as the dave campbell texas football insider to answer that question in no uncertain terms though we we do allow you know some some ties to come along and i sent you a list of the guy uh, of the positions and teams that i wanted you to talk about uh i did I guess, sort of. So I kind of want to start with the position, then I want to go to team. And I want to start with the one that most people are going to key on, uh, offensive line. So who's the best offensive lineman in the state of Texas? Yeah, that that was a tough one. I think the guy who stands above the rest, and and again, knowing that guys are going to get better, et cetera, et cetera, Mm -hmm. I I think that Sam Cosme at Texas is the guy. I, I think he's been a very consistent presence. I mean, he's not spectacular. He's not one of those guys who's just, you know, blowing everybody up necessarily, but he's just consistently solid. You know, he doesn't allow too many pressures. He holds up well in the run game. I think that if you're starting a team with one offensive lineman, I think Sam Cosme is the guy. The other guy that I would consider is, uh, Texas Tech's Jack Anderson, but he is coming back from injury, so you know it's it's a little bit dicey when when you got a guy who missed all the last year. No, I, I'm glad you mentioned Jack Anderson because uh, for me it's kind of like Ross Blacklock. A couple, uh, I guess last year when he was coming back from injury, and I was very bullish on him based on what I had seen the previous year. So Jack Anderson definitely gets circled a few times on on my list of guys to watch. Moving to uh, the other side of the ball, DI, uh, defensive interior, so uh, zero technique, one technique, three technique, who you think the best is in Texas? This was one of the hardest ones for me, uh, yeah. no question, because I think that there are a lot of guys, there's not an elite guy, you know, there's not like right. an obvious guy, but there are a lot of pretty good guys, so I'm going to project a little bit. I'm okay. going to go with Texas A&M's Bobby Brown. So he was a really solid player for them last year. Obviously more of a secondary guy behind Justin Matabuki, but mm-hmm. I think that he's really ready to take that role and, and be that that really dominant guy in the middle that, that causes havoc and, and clears the way for everybody else around him. Because I think that Texas A&M needs to have that kind of guy again because I think that mm-hmm. they are poised to have an elite caliber defense if everything can work out. And I, I think that Brown is potentially the guy who could make it go. No, I love that answer because for me, it's usually throwing a dart at the top of TCU's depth chart. Like, it's like, you know, you know, it's just, it's a safe bet. You know what I mean? You could, you could bet on Gary Patterson's defensive line like you bet on his linebackers, like you can bet on his secondary because they're always going to be good. So I like that. Um, let's go back to the other side of the ball. Let's talk about running back. And this feels like an odd year for running backs in Texas. So I'm interested to hear who you think the best is in Texas. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go down to the group of five ranks, and I'm going to go with Sincere McCormick at UCSA. So, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So okay. here's the funny thing about it. Uh, I wish I had the stat pulled up. I included it in my preview. But 
basically when he touched the ball, he averaged something like five and a half yards per touch or something like that, including both obviously receptions and, and uh, rushes. And the rest of the offense around him averaged like 4.3. Like he is insanely better than everybody else. <laughs> I feel so bad for him. I'm sorry. Yeah, like that's... It's bad. And he was a true freshman last year. Like this is a kid who came in off the street from, from uh, Converse Judson and immediately was the best player on offense. And so, I look, there are other guys who are, again, in that conversation. I think Keontae Ingram's a good player. I think that Isaiah Spiller could potentially be a breakout player this year. But, look, I think if there's one running back, that truly makes everything go for his offense. And to me, that's easily since he's Hmm. All right. Now I got somebody else I got to put on the list to watch. So let's, let's stay on that side of the ball. Let's go to wide receiver. Uh, always been pretty – doggone uh, good at wide receiver in Texas. I mean, if I don't say so myself, Oklahoma goes down there quite a bit to get a number of wide receivers. So who you got? Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, Oklahoma goes and gets the, the majority of the good wide receivers. <laughs> but, but that's a that's a whole other conversation. But, ah. uh, but um, look, I think, that, I think that this is actually a pretty easy choice for me. I mean, obviously, a lot of the best wide receivers in the state from last year, the Ragers, the Mims, all those guys graduated. Mm-hmm. So for me, I, I'm just going to simply go with SMU's Roger Robertson. Uh, he was averaging 100 yards per game before he got hurt eight games into the year last year. And SMU's offense was not the same after that. I mean, James Frochet put up huge numbers, but, but Robertson is really that big-bodied guy who can beat any matchup. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, now with Perse gone, you know, he's going to be the number one guy. And I, and I think that he could potentially have a 1,300-yard receiving season. Man, I swore up and down you were going to pick Corbin. Like, I, 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 I bet on myself, like, uh, down at Houston. Because, well, uh, I mean, it, I, I, I get where you're going, right? And, yeah, and it, yeah. like with That's actually a wildly underrated wide receiver duo. Uh, wide receiver quarterback too, and Shane Bruce Earl and Reggie Robertson, but not. Nah, well, well, go ahead. The, the guy that the guy that I would pick at Houston, if if I did pick, and I did definitely consider it, I would pick Marquez Stevenson. To me, he's the he's the really really dynamic guy on that Houston offense. Ah, uh, dude, I I thought he graduated. Okay, that's on me. I'm nope, sorry. Nope, he's he's a he's a sophomore about to be a junior. It's a, it's crazy. It feels like wow, I, man. Well, I, it does. It feels like he's getting into Denzel Mims territory now, because it felt like <laughs> I saw Denzel for ten straight years, and I was like, "When, when does he graduate? Ever?" No, <laughs> thank you for that, because I thought he was okay. So Clayton Tooney, Corbin, Marquez Stevenson, and then they get. Uh, did, does Patrick Carr return? Uh, I think Pat, I think he does. Okay, but but if, ooh no no no, I think that Patrick Carr actually graduates, okay. but then uh, Mulba Carr redshirted last ah, year. Ah, okay, and he's back, okay. and then um and then Kyle Porter is also. Okay. Nope. That's on me. That's on me. Nah. Okay. Uh, 